In the previous several lectures, we discussed a particle moving inside a rigid box. So basically, a particle inside a rigid box, also known as an infinite potential well, is confined to that box. It cannot move outside our rigid box. Now let's discuss a slightly different case. Now let's examine the motion of a particle inside a one-dimensional box that is not rigid. That is, the particle is allowed to move outside that box. And the potential energy of the particle outside the box is given by a finite quantity. So, to see exactly what we mean, let's look at the following diagram. So basically, we have the y-axis, which gives us our potential energy, u of our particle, and the x-axis represents the position of our particle along the one-dimensional axis. So basically, the left uh, wall of the box lies along our y-axis, and the position of the left wall is given by x equals zero while the position of the right wall is given by x equals L. So let's basically divide our regions into three different regions. So region 1 is given by the following section. So basically if the particle is found anywhere below x equals 0, that is given by region 1. If the particle is found inside our potential well, inside our box, that is given by region 2. And if the particle is found within this section to the right of x equals 0, that is given by region 3. Now, if the particle is in region 1 or in region 3, the potential energy of our particle is equal to a constant given by u naught. But if the particle is inside the potential well, our potential energy of the particle is given by 0. So, in this lecture, our goal will be to basically describe the motion of the particle when it moves along the x-axis, when the particle is found in region 1, 2, or region 3. So, let's begin by discussing region 2. Let's suppose the particle is found inside our finite potential well. So if the particle is found between the point 0 and L within the following region, the potential energy of that particle is equal to 0. And we know by Schrodinger's equation, Schrodinger's equation becomes as follows. So the first term on the right side basically goes to 0 and we see that our energy of that particle multiplied by the wave function psi is equal to negative h bar squared divided by 2m multiplied by the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x, where m is the mass of that particle, h bar is our constant, and e is the energy of that particle. Now, what exactly is psi? Well, psi is basically the wave function. It's the equation that describes the motion that our particle takes. So basically, if we take this equation and solve this equation in the same way that we solved it for the infinite potential, well, we get the following result. So our wave function psi, that is the solution to this Schrodinger equation, is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx plus b multiplied by cosine of kx, where a and b are some unknown constants. So, basically, if the particle is found inside the potential well, this is the equation that describes the motion of that particle. Now, let's move on to regions 1 and regions 3. Let's suppose the particle is now found in either one of these two regions, and that means that the potential energy u of x is now equal to a constant given by u naught. So, if u of x is equal to u naught now, Schrodinger's equation becomes as follows. Now, this quantity no longer disappears. So we have E multiplied by psi equals U not multiplied by psi minus this entire quantity. So, in the same way that we solve this equation for the solution, we want to take this Schrodinger equation and find what our wave function solution is. 
So let's basically take these two quantities and bring them over to the left side of our equation and set this equal to zero. So we see that h bar squared divided by 2m multiplied by the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x plus e multiplied by psi minus u naught multiplied by psi. Now notice that psi appears on this term as well as on this term. So we can bring that outside of the following two quantities. And let's also multiply the left and the right side by negative 2m divided by h bar squared. So if we rearrange this equation and multiply both sides by this, we get the following result. So, the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x minus this quantity inside the bracket multiplied by psi, and this is equal to zero. So basically, let's take this entire quantity inside the bracket and set it equal to alpha squared. So we let alpha squared a constant equal to 2m divided by h bar squared multiplied by e minus u naught. So basically, if we replace this constant with alpha squared, we get the following Schrodinger equation. And let's call this Schrodinger equation, equation 1. So basically, alpha squared is a constant because m is a constant, h bar is a constant, e is a constant, and u naught is also a constant. So, if we now take equation 1 and solve equation 1 for the wave function psi, we see that the wave function psi is equal to uppercase c multiplied by e to the power of alpha minus uh, multiplied by x plus uppercase d multiplied by c minus alpha multiplied by x. Now, in the same way that a and b are two unknown constants, c and d are also two unknown constants, where alpha that appears on the exponent term is basically the square root of this entire quantity. So, let's suppose for the time being that the particle is found within region 1. So if the particle is in region 1, that implies that the x value is always equal to a negative quantity. Now if the particle begins moving to the left along the x-axis and moves to a quantity of negative infinity, so basically if x approaches negative infinity, we see that this term e to the power of negative alpha multiplied by x will basically approach positive infinity. And if this second term is positive infinity, this psi will also be an infinite term. Now, because the wave function cannot actually be infinitely large, because that will make it physically uh, not meaningful, we see that this cannot actually be true. And basically, to basically get rid of this negative infinity, we multiply it by a zero. So this d quantity is equal to zero. So basically, if the particle is found within region 1, this quantity can potentially go to infinity. And to basically get rid of that, this d must be equal to 0. Now, if d is equal to 0, we see that the wave function is simply equal to c multiplied by e to the power of alpha multiplied by x. And this is only true if the particle is found within region 1. Now, by the same exact argument, if the particle is found within region 3, we see that our x value can potentially increase to positive infinity, and now this term has the potential to be equal to positive infinity, and so, to get rid of that, we set c equal to 0. So basically, if the particle is found within region 3, we have to set c equal to 0. And the wave function is equal to d multiplied by e to the power of negative alpha multiplied by x. So, 
let's stop for a moment and discuss what we were able to obtain so far. So, so far, we obtained the wave function, the equation that describes the particle's motion when the object is found in region 2. And we also found the wave function for when the particle is found in region 1 and also the wave function that describes when the particle is found in region 3. So basically, we have three different wave functions. Now, the entire wave function that is composed of these three wave functions, we know, has to be continuous. So basically, recall that for a wave function to be physically meaningful and measurable, we have to put a certain constraint on that wave function. That is, the wave function must be continuous along the entire x-axis. So that includes the fact that our wave function must be continuous and differentiable at the point x equals 0 and x equals L. So let's suppose the the wave function uh, in the region uh, 1 is given by, let's suppose, this quantity. Now the wave function in region 2 is given by, let's suppose, this quantity. And the wave function in region 3, let's suppose, is given by this function. So what this statement basically tells us is the following. To actual, for the wave function to actually be physically measurable, our wave function has to be continuous at these two positions and the slope at these two positions has to exist. So that means the derivative of this wave function, whatever it is, has to actually exist. So let's actually symbolize that in the following section. So what we just said basically means that our wave function 1 must equal to wave function 2 at the position at x equals 0. Basically, whatever psi of 0 is at region 1 has to equal whatever psi of 0 is at region 2. And likewise, the derivative of psi of 1 with respect to x has to equal to the derivative of psi of 2 with respect to x at x equals 0. And the same thing holds if x equals uh, L, psi of 2 must equal psi of 3, and the derivative of psi of 2 with respect to x must equal to the derivative of psi of 3 with respect to x. So let's continue on the left side of the board. So we basically know each one of the wave functions that describes the motion of the particle within region 1, region 2, as well as region 3. So the equation for our motion of the particle in region 1 is given by psi of 1. And the equation for the motion of the object in region 3 is given by psi of 3. Likewise, the equation for the motion of our object within region 2 is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx plus b multiplied by cosine of kx, where a and b are unknown constants. So basically, the only thing left to do is determine what the constants A is B, C, D, as well as E that appears in Schrodinger's equation. So basically, we have to set up five equations that each have A, B, C, D, or E and use those equations to solve for our five unknowns. So although we're not going to go through all the details of this calculation, we're going to do equation one and equation two. So basically, we're going to take the following condition. So let's suppose x is equal to zero. So if x is equal to zero, that is, if the particle is found at the left corner of the following finite potential well our box, then the following two things have to be true. So firstly, psi of 1 of 0 must equal to psi of 2 of 0. These two wave functions have to exactly coincide at the following location. And that's exactly what we mean by this equality. 
So, what exactly is psi of 1? Well, psi of 1 is equal to c multiplied by e to the power of alpha multiplied by x. And because we said x equal to 0, we see that c multiplied by e to the power of 0 is simply c. So, c is equal to, what exactly is psi of 2? Well, psi of 2 is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx plus b multiplied by cosine of kx. X. So if we let our x equal to 0, we see that sine of 0 is 0, so this cancels out, and cosine of 0 is 1. So b is equal to c. We'll call this equation 1. Now let's move on to this quantity. So we know that the first derivative of the wave function psi of 1 with respect to 0 is equal to the derivative of the wave function 2 with respect to 0. So if we take the derivative of this quantity, we get the following result. If we take the derivative of this quantity, that gives us this. So we see k multiplied by a of cosine 0 minus k multiplied by b of sine 0 is equal to alpha multiplied by c times e to the 0 power. So e to the 0 is 1, so we have alpha multiplied by c is equal to, so sine of 0 is 0, this cancels out, cosine of 0 is 1, so this is equal to k multiplied by a. So this is equation number Number two. Now, if we continue with this condition, if we follow the same exact procedure, we'll get two more equations from these two equations. And finally, if we normalize our wave function, we will get the third and final equation. And we can use these five equations to solve for our five unknowns.